If I die tonight before I finish, know that I died doing what I love doing the best. There's not a better way to go than standing here preaching the word of God to you. See my shirt, 77 on the way to heaven? They got that from me on my last birthday. Uh, now I'm going to have 78. I'm not late. 79. I'm on time. 80. I still got my old lady. <laughs> if I make it that long. <laughs> and she makes it that long. All right. Now I want to talk to you tonight again about the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't use that like the Calvinists use it. When the Calvinist speaks of sovereignty, they don't mean sovereignty at all. They mean the limitations of God. They think he's limited because he's unable to allow anyone in the universe to have a free will. It infringes upon him somehow. He's not sovereign enough to let you make up your own mind about anything. He makes your mind up for you before you're born and you're just a puppet on strings doing what he told you to do. If you go to hell, that's his fault. If you go to heaven, that's his fault. And they call that grace. There's no grace in it. Be no need for grace in it. That's an arbitrary God doing things that I'd consider very cruel and wicked. And so when I say sovereignty of God, I'm talking about that the Lord Jesus Christ is preeminent in all things. And the day's coming when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is preeminent Lord of all. The worst sinners will bow down to make that confession. The vilest will make that confession. The atheists who've argued against him will make that confession. People like Jordan Peterson who live by their mind will bow down and call Jesus Lord of all. All right, in Acts 2.24, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden held by death. For David speaketh concerning him, he's quoting Psalm, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So Jesus said that the father would not leave his soul in hell. During the three days that Jesus was dead, he descended into hell. Why? Because he was completing that representation of us fallen human souls. When we die, hell is our desert. We deserve to be nailed to a cross. We deserve to be mocked, ridiculed. We deserve to be beaten in the face with a stick, beard pulled out. We deserve that. Jesus came and bore our iniquities, carried our sorrows. The chastisement of our peace was on me. And with his stripes, we are healed, soul healed. And so that's our desert. Jesus Christ came and bore the full penalty of our sin. But then he descended into hell to complete the representation of fallen man. Now he did not go to the fires of hell, but it just so happens that hell is, or was at least, compartmentalized. When Old Testament saints died, there was no sufficient blood shed to take them to heaven. There was no basis for them. None of them were born again. None of them were sons of God when they died like Abraham, Elijah, Moses. When they died, there was no atonement made for them for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins for there's a remembrance made again every year of those sins. So they died in their sin. Now they died with a benevolent, loving and gracious God caring deeply for them and actually approving of their state of mind. God looked at those Old Testament saints and saw their faith and God was pleased with it. God was satisfied with it. God saw in those Old Testament saved characters that in eternity they would be completely in conformity with his will. He saw that he could seat them at his table 
and that they were already in heart sons of God. And so God approving of that state of heart and mind, that repentance and that faith that was in them, God prepared a place in hell where they would not suffer waiting for that redemption that would bail them out and atone for their sin. So in that shaft that leads down to hell, the place called the bottomless pit, on either side of it, on one side, the Bible speaks in Isaiah of those in the graves in hell, the sides of the pit, it says, in hell. So picture that shaft with holes in it and souls, lost souls, stuck in that little cavern with the sulfurous fumes coming up. And then God hollowed out a cavern, a cave, a big area, and he air conditioned it. He brought in light, vegetables, and all things pleasant. It was hell, but it was called paradise. It was Abraham's bosom, called that because that's where Abraham went when he died, and he was the father of faith. So it was named after him and he was chief potentate down there, I guess you might say. So those souls down there in paradise, I'm gonna read you the scriptures, just give me the whole picture. Those souls down there in paradise were waiting that day when they'd received word that atonement had been made. They were in prison and they were waiting for the prison doors to be opened so they could ascend up out of hell and join the redeemed around the throne of God. Now, if you didn't know that, you've been a tardy Bible student. You have been under some poor teaching because this is well known, well taught. I've heard it from my youth and I verify it from scripture as you will see tonight. It says several passages in Ephesians 4, 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. He took those who were in captivity and he captured them for himself and he led them out and he gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, that's up into heaven. What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? While Jesus was dead during those three days, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He went down into the ground, down some shaft or cavity, some pit, some hole. He went down, 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 down to where the sulfurous gases and fumes were unbearable and souls cried out in torment. And there he entered in to that place of paradise. Luke 23, 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This is the thief on the cross. And Jesus said to him, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So that thief did not go to heaven, but he did go to paradise that very day, which is where Jesus was. Heaven is not paradise. This paradise was a temporary state for the saved for whom there was no atonement made. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple, Luke 16, and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. He ate like you and I do on a daily basis. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. This is not a parable as seen by the fact that he gives the name of both Lazarus and the beggar. Parables, he never gives names. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So here before Christ's death, this beggar dies and the angels scoop him up, his emaciated, diseased, outswitch looking body laying there at the gate of this rich man. He sweeps him up, the angels do, and carry him gently into paradise where they set him down and offer him a drink of cool water 
where they set him before a table to eat and fare sumptuously like the rich man had been doing. Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now the rich man's in hell. Lazarus is in paradise, Abraham's bosom. The rich man in hell lifted up his eyes being in torment and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So within eyesight of the tortures of the damned, they could look and see paradise and see the people in a blessed state. All of them in hell. I'm not through. <laughs> a lot of scripture on this. Just a little here, a little there. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, which was in paradise, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good gifts, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, and they would. Had there been a way for the blessed in paradise to cross over that chasm and give a drink of water to the damned, they would have done it. Any of us would. And he said, thou would have sent him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So now he's asking for an evangelist to go to his family. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear him. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. Now that's an interesting proposition. If it's true, if it's true that when the lost dead stand before God in judgment, if God were to say at that time, any of you that want to love me, worship me, join the saints, and go to heaven can. Just bow down and call Jesus Lord and love him and admire him. If it's true that there would come out of the damned those who would say, I've made a terrible mistake. I, I, I see how sinful and wicked I've been. It's all my fault. God is worthy and I am repenting. I want to be saved. If God did not save them, I would fault him. Why wouldn't he? If he could, if he could save them at that point, why not? If they could be born again, their hearts change and they'd be his for eternity. Is God so narrow and vindictive? that he would just say, no, you're going to be damned anyhow because I gave you a chance, but I didn't hear much. Well, you had a little bit of a chance and no, I'm, I'm, I'm done with it. No, I don't think God's that way. I think that in that day of judgment, when the damned are given an opportunity, they'll curse him. They'll bring up their beef that they've had with him. They'll bring up how the mother died and he didn't do anything about it. They'll bring up how they were disadvantaged as a youth and forced into their life of sin. They'll bring up all kinds of excuses and not be repentant towards God because every one of them are reprobate. Only the reprobate go to hell. Only those whose conscience are seared as with a hot iron go to hell. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. And that's a fact. You know, if they were to <clears throat> tomorrow discover for sure Noah's Ark and find a journal in it where he lists all the animals, the amount of feed it would take and had the day by day the amount they'd use and what he thought would be left over and how much they would have and how long it would last. And they had his description of God speaking to him. And the carbon tested the ark and they found through genetic that all those animals had been present in that ark. 
in their feces. If that came out tomorrow, you'd think, well, that's going to make a bunch of believers. It won't make a single one. Amen. Not a single one. If they are not persuaded by the scriptures and the Lord Jesus Christ, all that would do is fill the church up with people that were scared or excited or interested who did not know God and it would pollute and dilute the Christian faith with false converts. For if it would produce true born again converts, I would say, God, why don't you do it? Why not? But you know, I keep up with archeological digs in Israel and the stuff they find is enough to convince any, any unbeliever. The evidence is there. In fact, there's evidence enough for the ark right now to make a believer out of somebody. Not so definitive that CNN is going to admit it, but it's there for anyone to see. So if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one for oaths from the dead. Now here's 1 Peter 4, 5, and 6. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. The quick are those who are alive and the dead are those who are dead. So he said, God is going to judge the quick, the, those now alive and the dead. For this cause, to judge the quick and the dead, was the gospel preached to them that are dead. That sounds like something Mormon, doesn't it? That when Jesus went into hell, he preached the gospel to dead people. You ever heard that? I mean, you've read it. Did it click in your mind? Did you understand it? You see, God is, as we would want him to be, very compassionate. He is very fair, as we would want him to be. He's very just, as he ought to be. He is all that other people say he's not. Preach the gospel to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit. So I can just see that day when the shadow is cast and in walks the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden they all jump up from the table and Lazarus says, that's him. I saw him. I heard him. I believed. And Isaiah said, that's him. And others who died recognized during Christ's lifetime, recognized the Lord Jesus. And they bowed down to worship, no doubt. They began to praise him. And he said, fellas, see these nail prints? You remember that song that said they pierced my hands and my feet? Yes, they did. You remember that Psalm that said I'd be rejected and despised? Remember what Isaiah wrote? And Isaiah starts quoting it. Okay, hold on. And so Isaiah begins to quote. Zechariah starts quoting. Nahum starts quoting. Habakkuk quotes. Ezekiel quotes. Moses quotes. They all join in together, over talking each other, quoting Bible prophecy. And Jesus said, it's all come true. I, my soul is in hell, but I will not see corruption. On the third day, I shall, be, I shall rise again. But in the meantime, let me tell you the good news. Do you remember how the lamb was killed in the temple and the blood was sprinkled? That was only a picture. My blood has been shed. And right now, it's lying underneath a cross up there on the hill called Golgotha. It's laying there, staining the ground, covering the blood of two thieves on either side. And after three days, I'm going to rise again. I'm going to ascend to the Father. And they began to shout their agreement and their praise and their thanksgiving. One by one, they were saved. One by one, they entered into a faith contract with the Lord God Almighty. One by one, they placed their faith in the finished work of Christ. He preached to the dead that they might be judged like the living. 
That's thrilling to me. First Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now this gets stranger. Which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. He's preaching to people who died in disobedience during Noah's day. All those people that were killed in the flood, they're going to get another chance. Here was a 10 year old boy died in the flood. He hadn't matured yet, didn't know much of anything. Here were some other people ignorant, didn't live out their full life and get a chance to be judged as men in the flesh. And he preached to them also. Hear it again. He went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, which when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. So it's those that were alive during the preparation of the ark. Wherein eight souls were saved. And that's the ones who were on the ark. Did you know all this? <laughs> been in your Bible all along. Isaiah 42, 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles. Listen to this. To open blind eyes, this is a prophecy, to bring out the prison, the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. See, that's not about releasing people incarcerated by the Romans. That prison house where the people sat in darkness was the darkness of death. And he came to set those prisoners free and took those that were captive and led captivity captive and gave gifts, the first one being salvation, unto men. Colossians 2:14, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now that is fascinating. It said that when he died, he blotted out the law that was written against us, contrary to us, took it out of the way. It was nailed to the cross. The law was nailed to the cross. Ten commandments and all 633 laws. Nailed to the cross, no longer in jurisdiction over any of us having spoiled principalities and powers. Now, you know what principalities and powers are? That's the authorities that govern the aliens. Those people that are probably coming on the earth right now in ships. It's those life forces that God created that are out there, both good and bad, that war in the heavens, as Daniel speaks of. Now, the Catholic Church and the children's books have fouled it up by painting little angels with little wings and they don't look like that at all. And so he spoiled the principalities and powers, having made a show of them openly. That means that Jesus mocked the devil and the principalities and powers of the air, the spiritual wickedness in high places. He mocked them and made a show. When he led captivity captive, do you remember after his resurrection, it said many of the saints which slept in the earth appeared in Jerusalem with Jesus. That's where they came from. He led those people out of that paradise. And when he did, he marched right by the gates of hell and said, ha, 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 look at this. You think you had power over us? You think you were gonna bring down and terminate the human race, my creation? You think you're gonna stop my bride? Look at this and he led captivity captive and distributed gifts to men, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Like an MMA wrestler waving his belt buckle and flexing his muscles and saying, I beat them all. Jesus, conquering hero. Psalm 22 describes his death on the cross, what he was thinking. Psalms 23, 
describes he's in the grave. It said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for thou art with me, thou rod and the staff that comfort me. Thou anointest my head with all my cup. Of Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's when he's dead. Psalm 24 says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, ye everlasting doors, for the king of glory shall come in. And the angels on this side says, who is the king of glory? And the angels over here say, the Lord mighty in battle. And you get this cross talk in heaven as Jesus comes with this big parade of the Old Testament saints walking into heaven from paradise. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Amen. Now, do you remember when the story of Samson went down to Gaza and they were going to kill him? And the same Gaza that's Gaza today, but they had some big iron gates with a frame, iron frame holding them, hinged there. And so they shut the gates and said, we got him now. Samson walked up to those gates and I'm sure he did what he did later. He, he said, Lord God, give me the strength. He grabbed the bars of the gates as they laughed and he began to heave and he jerked those gates right out of the stone. And then he put the whole outfit on his back and walked 20 miles back home with them and put them down. That's what you call making a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Now, Jesus Christ did that. He left hell and took the gates with him. Now he has the keys of death and hell, not the devil anymore. He now has jurisdiction and authority over it. Now, that's one half the message. <laughs> you got time for the rest of it? <laughs> doing, doing 15 minutes, 15 minutes maybe. John 20, verse 11. Now this is on the third day. But Mary, and that's out of whom he cast seven devils, stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto him, Because they've taken away my Lord and I know not where they've laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if you borne him away, tell me where thou hast laid him. I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her in a tone she recognized, Mary, inescapable, unavoidable. No one said it like that. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, Master. And he said unto her as she rushed him, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I send unto my father and your father to my God and to your God. Now he makes a distinction. He's my father and he's your father. He's my God and he's your God, but in a different way. So he said, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended. So when he has ascended, then she can touch him. And he's going to ascend right now. Now, why is he going to ascend? because he's got a complete redemption. He's just raised from the dead. And in the Old Testament, we read that the blood was sacrificed, the animal was sacrificed and the blood shed. That was half of it. It was incomplete. The blood then had to be taken by the priest into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the mercy seat where the cherubim covered it and God's presence dwelt. And when God saw the blood on the mercy seat, he put away sins for one year. That was just a grace act he did. He could not take away sin, but he just, he, on credit, he put it away for a year. So he said, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended. I ascend to my father and my God and your God. Now Ephesians 4, 8 says this. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, 
He led captivity, captive, and gave gifts to the men. Now he that ascended, what is it? But he first also descended the lower parts of the earth. He that descended the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Hebrews, whereof neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and water and scarlet, wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined to you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Hear this. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things, table, showbread, mercy seat, articles, people, it was necessary that the pattern of these things, the heavenly things, with better sacrifices than these. So the earthly tabernacle is a mini model of heaven. It is a reduced, scaled down model of heaven. And the mercy seat is the place, the cube in which God dwells. And that mercy seat had to have blood sprinkled on it. That mercy seat is where God sat. Now, in heaven, God sits on the throne, the mercy seat. Jesus is now man's the mercy seat, we read in Hebrews. We're told to come boldly to the mercy seat, that we may find grace and help in time of need. So, earth being a pattern of the heavens, it was necessary that the heavenly things be sanctified with a better blood. If you read Hebrews, it's better blood, better priesthood, better testament, better number of things on there. You can look it up. I got my Hebrews commentary. Keep reading. Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figure, representation of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared before the Father to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So for redemption to be complete, Jesus had to take his blood as a high priest into heaven itself, walk in before the throne and sprinkle it. That blood which will not see corruption. We already told you that. And he sprinkled the vessels. I think he probably put a little bit on the cherubim. And he sprinkled it where the seven spirits dwell in the lamps down there. And any of the Old Testament saints that were gathered around, sprinkled them too. Why? Because God is preparing heaven for sinners to walk in. And there is no atonement without the shedding of blood. He's making, he's applying that sacrifice that's been made before God. Now, let me tell you something that'll blow your mind. Jesus didn't die for you. He died for God. The blood was not shed for you. It has ramifications to affect you, but the blood was shed for God. Jesus did not apply the blood so you could see it. He applied the blood so God could see it. God is the one who demands payment for sin. And Jesus died to appease God Almighty and satiate his sense of justice so he could be accepting of those whom he would. So Jesus died for the Father. A granite, it flows out into having an effect upon you. But you are not the primary target of his death. The Father was. So he applied that blood so the Father could see it. And then we read in chapter 10, And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, 
sat down on the right hand of God. I remember one time I was working. I worked in construction when I was younger. That's where I got through college. And uh, it was late on a Friday, about five o'clock, and we were waiting on the paychecks to come. And, and I was a painter, and there was a black man there that was a roofer, I think. And he was all stretched out, laid back there, just about to go to sleep, looked like. And I said, you look like a man that's finished work. He said, yes, sir. He said, I, I was finished for the week. I'm going to go home and I'm going to sit down. I'm going to put my feet up and I'm not going to move till Monday morning. I'm done. And I said, do you know what? Jesus Christ right now is seated just like you. And he said, he's done too. I said, what's he done with? I said, he's done with paying for your sins. He's taken care of it. He's put it away. Died on the cross. I was about 16 years old then. I witnessed everybody I met. One sacrifice forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. You see, I don't need to be forgiven anymore. I've been forgiven past, present, and future for all of my sins based on that blood that was sprinkled. Let, what would you, if you are not, for, if a Christian you can do something that you're not forgiven of. What would you do to pay for it? What different would God do to pay for it? It's all been done. To the intent that now under principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You know what a manifold is on a car? It's got all these parts coming out of it like that, you know, where it connects the cylinders. Manifold. So the manifold w wisdom of God is all the ramifications of his wisdom. All the ways that it reaches out. Ways that we don't even fathom and understand. So we've, st we've studied some of that in the scripture today. The manifold wisdom of God and his eternal plan of redemption which he established from before the foundation of the world of which we are now partakers Glory be to God. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? It was fun for me, fun preparing it. All right, I'll quit. And I didn't die, that's amazing. <laughs>